Press play. Uh, well, I've already hit record. Oh, oh, so we're on. here we are. Uh, welcome. All right, welcome to the Tech Basement. Yeah. I'm Matt Swensky. I'm Dean Jackson. And this is the inaugural episode. We're kicking it off. We've got some big ideas, things we want to cover. Um, you know, what are we going to... What do we think about covering, Dean? Well, uh, well, maybe we should start off with what the tech basement is all about. Yeah. So we're obviously in a basement here. It's pretty darn cool. Look at this basement. It is. It's a real life techie basement. Right? Yeah. 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 There's lots of equipment down here. So the idea of the tech basement was uh, to showcase some technologies that are used in the field, but maybe put a real life spin to it. Is that? Yeah, so that sounds sounds like the plan. We'll take some new emerging technologies. We'll talk about it. Um, there's, you know, might say, well, what, a lot of North American podcasts and things are out there. We're going to take it and put an Aussie spin on on that, right? So I'm an Aussie. Yeah, and I'm Canadian. So, so we've, we've got Can Aussie. Can Aussie. Yep. Yeah. So we've got a bit of an international presence here. But Matt, I got to ask you, Aussies don't have basements. I know, but, uh, you know, bottom floor, basement, what, what, you know, what else you call it? We're sort of kind of half underground here, I would say. Almost. Yeah. yeah. There's yeah. A, lot of, a lot of tech equipment around, right? A bunch of servers and PCs. We'll, we'll talk about that through some of these, these episodes, I reckon. And it is a bit chilly down here, too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, it is. So, uh, yeah. So, look, that's, that's, I guess, what this whole, whole thing's about, right? So, we're, we work at EMC. Yep. You're an SE. I'm, I'm an SE. Yep. Yep. Um, but we're going to look at around the industry and see what's going on and take some topics. We'll get some guests in, we'll interview them, uh, find out a bit of, not just about what they're working on and what, what they do, but a bit about them themselves personally. So we're going to choose random guests. How are we going to choose these guests? Any idea? Well, we're going to get, look for third platform companies, big data, DevOps, agile development, um, open up that, that whole new world. That sounds something. really fun. Um, so when we bring these guests on, are we just going to, like, we got to get to know them, don't you think? Well, they're all going to be techies. Yeah. Right? So That should be pretty easy. I think every techie at heart has some great sci-fi film that they love. Mm, um, yeah. Dean, what's, you, you must have one. What's yours? Well, I would have to say it is probably a little series of films. Uh, you know, Stanley Kubrick, Arthur C. Clarke books, 2001, 2010, Space Odyssey. Um, I would say those are my favorite because... You know, the technology of 2001 in the time period, you know, the, the scenes that were shot were pretty darn amazing. It was mid-80s? Mid was that? Uh, was no, around? that was, uh, I think that was early 80s, 2001, okay. late 70s. Wow. I know 2010 was 84 uh, when that one was uh, shown in the cinemas. Yeah. Um, but the cool thing was HAL 9000, artificial intelligence, you know, really cool stuff. So what I have to say, those are my favorite. What about you? Uh, so for me, Back to the Future, the trilogy, yeah. but particularly Back to the Future 2, right, Marty goes forward in time, uh, jumps forward to 2015, so he appears like right about now, I think, yeah. uh, we're, we're coming up. And I think we already have those floating, almost have those floating skateboards. We're I getting saw, there. I saw a hoverboard thing on YouTube the other day, and it uh, looks like they're almost there. I'm seeing those guys on those wheels that go around. Those are almost a hoverboard going around the city, so that's yeah. pretty cool stuff. So we're going to get to the inner geek of our, our guests, right, the sci-fi film, I guess, the other topic, you know, I, I certainly wasted a lot of time on computer games as a kid. Gaming, yes. Yeah. We all grew up on gaming. What was yours, Dean? Well, uh, if, if I had to pick a gaming system that I grew up on, it definitely have to be Commodore 64. Yeah, right? I had one of those too. Yep. Yeah, I think we all did. You know, one of my favorites of the Commodore 64 is the, the five and a quarter floppy. Mm -hmm. You know, we used to buy the single-sided ones and then make it double-sided. You had to punch a hole in it. <laughs> and my friends that were really lucky had the little square punch. So the other hole was really square and matched. I just used the round hole punch. So, right. But it all worked. Um, but my favorite game was Summer Games by far. Uh, blew a whole summer uh, with the Boss joystick. Played the Country Epics. So if everybody knows that game and, you know, just tried to break all the records in that one. So good fun there. What about you? Uh, so for me, it was a game called Elite, and uh, it, you know, I spent a lot of hours on that. It was a space simulator. You know, we didn't have the graphics that we have today. It was planets were lines and stars were dots. But uh, yeah, it was uh, was a great a great uh, way for me to spend my my childhood. Yeah, so, so Commodore sixty four all the way. Yeah, absolutely cool. So. so Let's get on to today's topic. Yeah, right. We've got a guest coming in. We'll introduce him in a moment. Yeah. Um, but you know, let's we're gonna do a thing called uh, buzzword bingo. Right. Oh, is this how we're gonna choose the topic? That's right. Yeah. So uh, let's let's uh, 
Get on the machine. Yeah, I, I, yeah I've got a special uh, app here that will randomly choose a topic. There, there's nothing planned about this at all. Yeah. Oh, okay. Hadoop. Topic for today is Hadoop. Great buzzword yeah. in the industry. Um, what do you know about Hadoop, Jim? Well, when I think Hadoop, I think large elephants, mm. colorful elephants. Yeah. I think um, analytics and maybe some commodity hardware. Yeah, yeah. So for me, it's you know open source technology used by companies like Yahoo to uh, really enable and change the way they, they engage with customers. Mm -hmm. uh, but you know we should bring a guest on to talk a bit more about it. So yeah, because the whole point of Tech Basement is to show how things are really used, right? That's right. Yeah. So uh, without further ado, let's introduce our and guest. Who is it? Well, he'll be here in a moment. Okay. So welcome to the Tech Basement. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Dean. Welcome. So we have with, with us uh, Ned Shawa. Ned, you're an SE with Hortonworks. Uh, can you tell us a bit about yourself, your background? Correct. Uh, so my name is Ned. I used to uh, work at EMC uh, for two years, and after that, I've joined Hortonworks. Um, I am the solution engineer at Hortonworks. Um, I cover. Um, I used to cover Australia and New Zealand only. Now we're covering the whole APAC region. Big job. Uh, mm -hmm. It is a big job, uh, but we're trying to be more specialized rather than just one one guy doing everything. Uh, and I work with um, with a bunch of guys, very smart SEs around the region, and every one of us is kind of like concentrating in one uh, or two main tools. And yeah, it's working good for us. So now. You've got a, you're doing a master of analytics at the moment, right? So I am. I am. I'm a little bit behind now. <laughs> I should be. Uh, I, I didn't do the last semester. I postponed the last semester because um, I was under a lot of work and under a lot of pressure, so yeah. I couldn't um, I couldn't finish it. But cool. yeah, so if it's still doing that, and, and you run a meetup in, in Melbourne. What's the meetup called? Well, uh, I run uh, two meetups. Uh, two meetups. Now. So one now, uh, one in Melbourne and one in Sydney. Uh, that's the Apache Spark meetup uh, for the viewers. Uh, so we do that. We try to do that every quarter, at least once. Um, yeah. Sometimes we, especially when we get a lot of guest speakers, we, we try to emphasize on having guest speakers talking rather than technologists talking about the new technology. So we want the users to come and tell us about their experience and their yeah. specific um, um, project or what they have done with, with Apache Spark. Cool. That's very cool. And so so what do you think of the tech basement? What do you think of this, uh, look at this place? I like the place. Like uh, I remember being here a year ago, and probably there was nothing here but three PCs and three screens. Yeah, it's that progressed a lot more. Now That's right. I can see there's there's like lighting. There's, Xboxes. Uh, there's, there's three more it's, monitors, and there are three Xboxes. Yeah. And I was looking at the Connect, and I just bought an Xbox last week, and oh my god, my wife is gonna kill me. <laughs> does she know yet? Oh, she does. She okay. does. That's that's the problem. She said, "Oh my god, you're you're, you're already. I'm not seeing you enough." during the day and now you bought an Xbox. Yeah. <laughs> now we'd be remiss if we didn't po point out the, uh, the the very cool dress sense that's going on here. So Heisenberg. So, so Heisenberg, my, uh, to be honest, my wife kept on convincing me, oh, you've got to watch this series. This series is amazing. Yeah. You have to watch And I was like, oh, come on, I don't have time to do that. No, no, I don't want to do it. No. And then I was like, you know what? I'll give it a try. I'll see the first couple of episodes. And I've worked the first couple of episodes yeah. and I finished the that's whole it. seasons in less than a month. <laughs> so you, and now Breaking Bad, right? They said it finished. There's rumors it might it might go on another season. Here. So I haven't heard that. Uh, I bought the t-shirt from Universal Studios and I, and, I, and I got lucky that I could see the van itself where, they, where it had all the bullets uh, penetrated the van. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and the crappy car that, uh, uh, that, that he, he, Heisenberg had. Um, I've watched Better Call Saul, so that oh, yeah, was, yeah. That was the, the follow up. Yeah, that was, yeah, that was kind of like the follow up series. Right. Uh, it, it's it's not bad. Uh, it's definitely not as good as Breaking Bad, but it's definitely worth We're watching. Checking, yeah. Uh, yeah. So so part of the tech basement, we decided this in the yep. first episode. Uh, aside from t-shirts, so I guess that's a new rule now. We have to wear. Something cool, cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I can uh, see HDFS cluster luck. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, have you been getting lucky after? <laughs> <laughs> it's lucky if I get HDFS working, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is when you call a port works and fix your problem. <laughs> All right, we'll get we'll get to that. So we got we got two questions we want to ask you. I'm going to ask every guest this, but uh, so you touched on favorite TV show, obviously. Favorite sci-fi film, right? That inner geek. What what's dri what drove you as a uh, kid? Or so so of course uh, uh, the Matrix would would, would be a winner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
uh, I would think about Minority Report as well, especially because now it relates a lot to what we're doing. To predicting in the predict future. Predict yeah. Predicting the future, yeah. catch the bad guys before they become the bad guys and that sort of stuff. So it's pretty cool story. Yeah. And when I watched that movie, I was like, you know what? I don't think that this thing will ever happen. Yeah. But now I can see things like that. Are Hadoop's enabling that. that. Hadoop is definitely a major part of enabling that. Cool. All right. And so what about video games? So we, we had a chat earlier about our favorite video games uh, growing up and what we blew the most amount of time on. So well, you've got to have one. Well, in my time, it was Nintendo. I don't Nintendo. Know I Nintendo. Really? So wasn't you, Super Nintendo. Do you know what ours was? was? Uh, <laughs> Take a guess. It would be Atari. Uh, kind of pre Atari. Yeah. yeah. Pre Atari. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nintendo, and which game on the Nintendo? Uh, I guess everybody played Mario. Uh, uh, so, it's the very first one? It would Super definitely Mario be, Brothers. yes. It wasn't Super Mario at that time, was it? it was uh, Mario. Sorry, it's just Mario Brothers. Yeah, it was Mario Brothers. The very first one. The very first one. We had to so. warp through to get to the end. Yeah, yeah, I remember it. Like, uh, it was a lot of hours. Probably what Mortal Kombat was there as well. Oh, yeah. Mortal Kombat oh, I think Nintendo? you're thinking Super Nintendo oh, now. Now, now on Sega. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, All very right. cool. Anyway, but right now, I I play, uh, Bat I love Batman, the new Batman. Oh, if yeah. you haven't played Batman, Arkham, uh, Arkham City is Batman. awesome, and the newer one is even even better. Uh, so I've got my, my home theater at home. I've got a projector with, with a sound system, and playing Batman in just pitch black with the big screen oh, in front of you awesome. is like, amazing. Cool. And, and Call of Duty is the winner, of course. Yeah, Call of Duty. New winner. one coming out later this year. You'll get, be able to get on your Xbox One. Uh, I did. Yeah. Late, later in the year, there'll be a new one. New one coming out. Really? Yeah. Uh, is that a beta version now? I don't know. Yeah, I've, sure I've, I've heard it's a beta version, and, and some people are getting access to it. Okay. Cool. Cool. So we should talk a bit about Hortonworks. All right. Um, so tell us so, a little bit about Hortonworks. People that don't really know the organization. So Hortonworks, uh, Hortonworks is the first company to go public in in the Hadoop space, which was a really a big step. Um, mm -hmm. uh, one of the things you might you might have seen on the news recently that they have reached up to a hundred million dollars in sales um, as and in, in in less than five years. Yeah. And this is something a lot of companies struggle to get there. Um, there, there was a lot of uh, doubt at the beginning from a lot of um, uh, outsiders looking at Hadoop, saying, "Is, is this is happening? Is this is going to be uh, the the next big thing?" Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people um, thought that Hadoop wouldn't be the right platform for the next generation, um, and that was like over three or four years back. Now we can see all the enterprise features being applied onto Hadoop, um, and um, uh, Hadoop now is definitely becoming the next generation platform. Uh, I'm, I'm so happy being part of Hortoworks uh, during this um, uh, journey, uh, enabling the different people and working on, on, on Hadoop. And, and so Hortonworks in that picture, what's, what makes Hortonworks unique? Uh, so Hortonworks uh, was founded by a bunch of, uh, bunch of very smart guys out of Yahoo. Mm -hmm. uh, they, uh, and the pitch was very clear from the beginning. Um, it was an open source uh, product and we're talking about, we always try to differentiate between open source and open core. What, um, yeah, what does that really mean? Open source, open it's core? A, it, I, I thought at the beginning that, you know what, it doesn't really matter because the source code is there anyway. But it turns out, like imagine you're a customer team and you, you always want it to have this feature and you can do it and you have actually developed that feature. Yep. but. But you can't still use it because the company wouldn't allow you to do that feature or to integrate that feature in their product. And this is what is open core. Mm -hmm. Oh, so I figured out how to do something. Actually, wrote the solution, but I can't give that back. Exactly. Wow. And this is open source. Everybody becomes part of that product, so Correct. you become part of the developers for that product. Yeah. So when you look, when you look on how. Um, uh, the, the traction becomes for the software, uh, the open core, the company would employ like 20 developers on a product and the 20 developers might increase one or two every year or something like that. Yeah. Well, in open source, you're actually employing the whole community of yeah. users yeah. to be your own developers. So uh, something like Hive, we grew it all the way to over 200 developers just because uh, a lot of people out there are using it and they're liking the, the features and they want to commit on new features and they're bringing back 
more stuff into um, into the GitHub. So, so it's Hortonworks 100% open source? Is there anything, yeah. everything completely? Everything That's 100%. Awesome. And, and we actually took it to the next level where we started looking at, okay, what, what do we have missing bits in Hadoop that we can make it better? And one of the things was, um, Hadoop installation, for example, provisioning Hadoop is not an easy task. It's it's it, it would take at least uh, anywhere between one to three days uh, wow. just to do a vanilla install of Hadoop somewhere. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we bought a company uh, called Sequence IQ, mm -hmm. and Sequence IQ got this awesome product called CloudBreak, and it allows you to provision clusters Very uh, in in we're talking about less than five minutes. Well, wow. so from Days from days to minutes to five minutes. Wow, that's and that, amazing! Exactly, and the problem the problem was if you're a developer or an analytics professional, you don't want to waste your time on deploying it. You want mm -hmm. to waste your time, or you want to spend the time on doing the the the, the, the analytical part of it, uh, the equations part of it, um, the algorithms part of it. So we gotta ask strange questions in the tech basement. So Hortonworks uh, and uh, sorry, I gotta go back again okay. to that because that's important. So when we bought CloudBreak, we didn't just bring it into the Hadoop space. We actually open sourced it the back to the thing, community. Yeah. Yeah. We've yeah. done so the same. The strategy is you is everything to be. Okay. And okay. security was a big uh, concern mm -hmm. on Hadoop as well. And we bought a company called XA Secure that, that okay. does Very the security cool. on well, it's, uh, we'll drill down more on security. I'd love to get that uh, in a moment. But um, I know you're going to ask a question I was keen on asking. Yeah, yeah I'm just begging to know Hortonworks. Like, so I think back to you know childhood, Dr. Seuss. Uh, you know, Horton here's a who, you know, the elephants. Yeah. There's got to be something going on there with, with that. Is that the naming that, of it? Yeah. Is, that, is, that, where is it that where it comes well, from? Where does uh, it come from? Uh, th this is a big embarrassment for me. Being you don't know. Working you for don't, a company. You don't <laughs> ask a question. All right. No, I got to. So, you know what you're doing? As soon as this is done. <laughs> the people out there, you can fire me now. I don't know why. You got to go look it up. It's got something to do with Dr. Seuss. It has to. <laughs> All right, so now I have a theory on the Australian market, and I've talked to a lot of customers, companies in here, and there's a few companies, you know, if you look at some of the ComBank, for example, some of the retailers, uh, immigration, they seem to be leading in terms of this big data journey, right? I was talking to uh, somebody at ComBank, and they said, our, you know, our, our product is shifting. We, we offer a product to customers, but the value really comes from the data around it. They're, they're leveraging lots of data to do that. So I'm seeing it. A few companies do that really well in Australia, but I, my theory is that there's a lot more that need to catch up. And you, you've obviously you've immersed yourself in this space. What what are you seeing in the Australian market? Are we are we lagging? Are we ahead? Where's... So uh, um, I, I've been going to the US uh, uh, once every three to six months now, and um, I, I was lucky enough to see where the people have taken Hadoop and the analytics over there compared to here. Mm -hmm. um, Unfortunately, every time I go there, I feel like oh, I'm going with the um, um, like I'm just going ten years ahead of time, and then coming really? back. That far ahead, it is. Wow. it is. I would say anywhere between uh, five to seven years at least. So, what do you think's holding us back? Like, you know, if you know, I see Australia as a as a tech leader. Like, we mm -hmm. we typically have been early adopters in a lot of technology. Well, virtualization yeah. cloud. We seem to be ahead on those. That's right. So, That's what's right. going on here? Uh, with, with, I, with I guess. I guess there's a lot of people who want to get into the Hadoop and analytics space, um, but a lot of people are still waiting on uh, others to do that. Maybe mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot of uh, risk averseness uh, concept here, uh, so people will wait until they see um, other people succeeding. But we always talk about this is this is the this is the value proposition. If you get to a product before your competitor does and you start monetizing the data that you're not using right now, this is where you get the competitive advantage and you start getting ahead. So, so do, you, yeah. <laughs> yeah, do you think there's a threat to Australian businesses if if there are US and global counterparts that are leveraging this technology really well? And it might not be in a traditional, say, bank. It might be in a you know startup social networking company or somebody who's doing this well. There's a risk for them to uh, come into the market. I would definitely let, let's let's look at, at a real life example. Uh, uh, One three cab has been here since forever, yeah. and they had their app since forever. Yeah. And Uber came in no time, and they wiped Y three cabs off the map. So now, if you want a taxi, would you ever bring up the One three cabs yeah. app, or would you go immediately to Uber? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is this is an example of mm. what's happening here. So definitely in in the non-localized market you can easily be taken by somebody who had jumped on the next level and yeah. monetized the data so what are the value props that would 
draw customers over to Hadoop uh, that would, you know, give them a little bit of incentive. So you mentioned, you know, obviously some more value out of the data. Uh, I think you were mentioning cost. Is there a cost involved, like cost savings, things like that? So the, the most important stuff, um, and if you look at the traditional way of storing data, uh, people have been storing data mainly in databases. Other than that, it would be either thrown on a file server and get compressed and it would immediately uh, get locked and blocked forever. Or look at a new way to start storing data. Now, uh, any company now, for example, works with social media. Tell me any company that you know who's collecting social media feeds and actually storing that and doing something with it. Um, I, I haven't seen much of that. No, I would say there's monitoring and guess what? social the media sites here. So if I you know, post something on a social media site for a particular uh, service, mm -hmm. it's well monitored, but I don't know how much historical or analytics is done on that. So, so that's very uh, current level monitoring. Right. And that would be usually the marketing department who's actually taking yeah. care and looking for that. But what if you want to match that customer who's on who's tweeting on your product with your customer database to check if he's one of your customers and he's one of the happy ones or an unhappy ones and this exactly. is something you can do or high with. value and low value and you, you work out how to how that's to right. that, yeah. Yeah. respond to that differently right so yeah <laughs> okay so so i think australian companies could probably catch up a lot of, i think a lot of organizations are uh, experimenting are. with the dupe it's in the labs so that some are. some have done it in a, in a big way but it's a small number Right, whereas others are still kind of piloting and trying to work out where it fits. Definitely. So if you look at the probably uh, the enterprise um, uh, level customers in Australia are probably have it in, in, in the agenda for this year or maybe mm -hmm. next year, at least experimenting what they can do. Yeah. Uh, with that Hadoop, um, you're, you're actually blocking innovation in companies. Uh, the, you, you have you have data scientists, you have analytical people who needs data to start producing insights. Mm -hmm. If you don't have the data, how are you going to produce insights? Or if you're having limited siloed data, you'll never be able to produce an insight um, around the whole uh, company. Yeah, yeah. And so, and you think that the skill set in data science and this is is a limit. So we had that. So this, this is this is an interesting one. The, the skill sets. Mm -hmm. Uh, there have been a lot of talk globally on the skill sets for the data sciences. Yeah. And and I guess, and from what I have seen, because the, the good thing in these meetups that I'm doing, that I get to see a lot of the people on the ground who's doing stuff. Um, and I've seen a lot of data scientists so far, and a lot of people who got the analytical skill who can actually bring us to the next level and the next generation of, of, of data and apps. Mm -hmm. The shortage we're facing now is in data engineers. And really? this is, and this is something the U.S. doesn't suffer from. So, the U.S. got a lot of data engineers right now because any uh, Java programmers could be easily um, uh, transformed into a data engineer. But here, we I've, I've been working with the Java programmers a lot and the Java meetups, going there and talking about, all right, this is the next role. This is if you want to mm. fast forward your career, you're gonna jump on the data engineering part, learn these new stuff that are happening, learn Scala, learn Hadoop administration, uh, integration, and that sort of things. So mm, our struggle in Australia is mainly around data engineers rather than data scientists. Yeah. Okay. So another uncomfortable question mm -hmm. we always have to ask them True. so do you see Hadoop just wiping out the data warehouse the enterprise data warehouse so you've seen that in the US <laughs> customers just I'm just gonna, yeah, yeah just gonna go all to do right so what are you seeing with so that? let me I'll, I'll, I'll try to be honest as much as possible I don't think Hadoop is mature enough to be a complete data warehouse okay um, um, in, 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 in our Hadoop summit um, in San Jose this year uh, we had eBay talking about their, their data warehouse that was on Hadoop. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, eBay was talking about how much they're struggling with a, with a, with a table of 100 million records and they had to work on a project called Apache Kylan and Apache Kylan trying to solve the problem by building cubes on the warehouse, which kind of simulate what the data warehouse is doing. But are we there yet? No, we're not. Uh, I guess um, we, we love to work with the existing data warehouse platforms. And we always consider ourselves an extension to the data warehouse platform. So extension of many different technologies out there. 
lots of partners that you work with. Correct. Yeah. And usually this is the easiest use case to jump on with, with numbers that, that the management can justify on, on spending mm -hmm. on uh, either new resources or infrastructure for Hadoop. And I guess this example you talked about earlier, Hadoop's a really good fit for unstructured data. Right? When you want to take that ingest, that massive amount of data that's not really in a consistent way and do something with it that you match yeah. it with the identifiers of people that are already in your That's right. And, I, and based, based on, I've seen a funny story about um, um, a company I worked with and they were uh, storing tweets in a data warehouse. And I was like, oh my God, so how much how much is that costing you? <laughs> For the Twitter. And, and they were like, oh, it doesn't even store in a right format because it, the, the, the Twitter is more like a JSON semi-structured mm -hmm. file and, and we're trying to put yeah. it in a, in a completely structured database. Yeah. Uh, and, and this is where we're the... Australian the, customer obviously hasn't hasn't adopted the technology. <laughs> <laughs> so again, okay, and back to Australian customers, and without giving away customer names, are there what's a what's a really cool project you're seeing locally? Is there something that, uh, that you're saying this is a great use case for Hadoop? Uh, so as I said, the number one use case would always be the data warehouse offload. Um, mm -hmm. uh, is the data warehouse offload is a very interesting story um, from a numbers level and business level? It is. Uh, from what I'd like to talk about, I'd like to talk about uh, that, about the second use case that is coming after, and usually it's the most interesting one. So whether you're working with the energy sector and they're collecting data on their smart meters usage and how the meters are being used and when to give you the best offers on your electricity, or if you look at retailers when they look at, especially with, with, with the IoT. So IoT is a, is a big thing for us, Internet mm -hmm. of Things. So beacons, you know, the beacons are beacons bringing in example, all the stores. Yeah, beacons, yeah. beacons is part of the IoT. For example, now in, in my house, I've got, I've got, I was looking at the Wi-Fi list and who's connected <laughs> to my Wi-Fi and I found out that I've got a 12 devices connected to my Wi-Fi and they're all producing data. So I've got my doorbell that sense any motions coming in front of it and send me an alert on every motion or whoever uh, uh, rang my door. <laughs> and I've got a, I've got another camera which detects any motion happens in front of it and again send me an alert on everything happening. And, uh, and, and, and just stuff like that. And I've got the Belkin uh, Wemo things that you yeah. can actually tell it, oh, how much electricity I'm spending here. And is that light on and off? And is my coffee machine should work at seven o'clock in the morning and shuts down by itself at six o'clock? <laughs> so you've got a pretty day. automated home. Yeah, I right? try to, yeah, it, it gets a little bit more complicated. Are you capturing the data in Hadoop? Not is really, no, that's the problem. <laughs> and that's the problem when you work with proprietary uh, yeah, right, uh, yeah. environments, you, you don't get the access to the full data. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, so I always have an eye on, 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 on what's happening in the IoT space. And one of the coolest IoT use cases that we're working on is um, uh, stuff that works with proximity sensors. And these are, yeah, as you said, it collects beacons, who is passing by, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I walk up to something and I have a look at it, maybe, in a retail store. Correct. Maybe so pick it up. Check it out. So, so proximity. Uh, there was. I'm pretty sure the name was proximity. That was the company who found out um, how to build a stickers, uh, be, like like beacon detectors on a sticker base. So, uh, retailers would, would. It would be a great use case for retailers to uh, stick the sticker on a, on a handbag, for example. Somebody will pick their handbag, look at it. Doesn't not happy with the price. They put it back. They will walk away. It will immediately send a market advertisement to the mobile device near to it, saying, "If you buy it now, you'll get a ten percent discount." For example, that's pretty cool stuff. Yeah. Awesome. And all that going back, all that data go back into a big Hadoop instance. The, uh, who uh, you can see how much traction every item is getting. Are a lot of people looking at this item or not? Is this is a hot aisle that people are moving um, mm -hmm. uh, in or not? Very cool. Yeah, that's and cool so, use case. so we're EMC SEs, right? Um, we have company Pivotal, uh, and Hortonworks have a bit of an alliance now with Pivotal. Could you talk a bit about? Uh, so, about that? Uh, so first of all, we do thank Pivotal. Pivotal found uh, the open data platform. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the open data platform was about to standardize all the enterprise softwares and, and, and products for hardware from the companies together. And that was a big thing for HodoWorks. Um, and, and they standardized everything on HodoWorks um, Hodo data platform, uh, which is great. Uh, uh, we, uh, we work together so everything gets certified immediately. For example, EMC is part of the ODP. Uh, so Isilon will be first to be certified with the HodoWorks all the time. 
um, SAS is part of the e um, uh, mm -hmm. the ODP. Splunk is part of the ODP. Uh, Wendisco is part of the ODP. <laughs> and the, funny, the list is growing every quarter. There are new logos on the list, and and, yeah. and it 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 feels like this is a real thing now. It's no longer just um, just a a, a try or an attempt to bring so, something together. So you're seeing a good ecosystem of other products plugging in, uh, like I do a lot of SAP work, SAP specialist at AMC, seeing, I know there's an integration between Hadoop and HANA in memory database. That's right. You're seeing use cases like that, consolidated queries. A lot of them, a yeah. lot of them. Uh, being able to, uh, the federated query uh, uh, jumps up a lot. Uh, yep. That's one of the use cases. And the second use case is now, we always talk about the, um, uh, as, as we said, all the SAP HANA and the Teradata, for example, um, uh, they're great data warehouses to store the structured data, but what about your unstructured yeah, ones? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hmm. So, changing topics a little bit, right? So, we talked about names earlier with Hortonworks. Um, you know, Hadoop's obviously an unusual name. We've got things like Pig and Hive and uh, Scoop and Flume. Zookeeper. Uh, Zookeeper. Who chooses these names? And at least there's a theme, right? <laughs> but, uh, What's, so there's so, so many things I guess for somebody learning Hadoop coming at us. What what are the important ones, and what what do we need to know? So if you're making fun of names, wait until you hear about LLAP. So L -L 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 -A -P. L -L -A -P. Give us a hint. So so this is a new feature coming to Hive. Um, uh, uh, I guess on the, within the next version, hopefully we will have that feature. And this is to bring Hive more to a transactional and sub-second uh, uh, query speed. So LLAP. Uh, what would you think, by the way? You got to give us this control protocol uh, or something like that. Logical. <laughs> mm. Live long and process. Prosper. Live, live long and, and, and process. process. That's funny. Prosper. <laughs> and process. And process. Live long uh, and process. Okay. Uh, and lip. Okay. Uh, it's very cool. <laughs> some other thing will happen here. <laughs> yeah, <I'm not> sure. <laughs> no, no, no. We just we'll added all this that line. Don't worry. Okay. No, so that is very cool. Who chooses these names? Developer? Definitely would be the engineers. It wouldn't be somebody in marketing. And I guess by the time these names were being picked, there was no marketing department in Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> and and so, so, what do we need to know about those? So, the, uh, so definitely, uh, the the first question we get hit with uh, at a customer side. Uh, okay, there's a zillion ingestion tool out there. What do I use? Do I need a message queue? Do I not? There's uh, Kafka. There's RabbitMQ. There's uh, Flume. There's Spring XD. There's Storm. There's um, um, so they're all about bringing data to the Hadoop. Most of these Splitting products are about, yeah. yeah. So yeah. besides Pig, Pig, which is a, a, a post-processing or processing or language now, if we yeah. can say, yeah. um, and it's mainly the ingestion part is what people spend um, the most of time on, especially mm -hmm. if you have a use case where you uh, you're ingesting structured and unstructured data together. Yeah. Uh, so Hive, Hive is really turning Hadoop into a data warehouse. Exactly. Yeah. So Hive is the, uh, if you can think of the, the structured database for Hadoop, it would be always Hive. So yeah. th this Hive would be the evolution partially to maybe replace certain functionalities of those enterprise data warehouses? Um, no, I wouldn't think so. I'll, I'll still be still be think yeah. it would be more an extension of yep. the existing yep. data warehouses. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and when you talk about Scoop, for example, Scoop, for example, is the best way to to move data from existing data data warehouses or database or tables directly to to Hadoop. Uh, yeah. If you look at uh, uh, something like Storm, Storm is the only tool out there that can bring you ingest data in real time, sub second, and and yeah. you can do analytical um, yeah. analytics on top of that. And Mahout. Mahout was a library of machine learning algorithms um, that was under the Apache program as well. Uh, funny thing, uh, Mahout now uh, shifted completely under the Spark project. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, Spark, the machine learning component uh, under Spark, is now Mahout. All oh, right. Okay. Yep. So there's so, no. And yeah, that brings us to the next topic. So tell us about Spark. Spark, kind of a big new trend. Yeah, Spark been been trending for what, almost for a year now. Uh, it's been trending heavily. Uh, Spark promoted themselves as the end memory engine for Hadoop, and that was pretty cool yeah. because everything was map produced in Hadoop, and people who wanted to do anything more than batch didn't like it much. And Spark came in and solved a lot of problems. Uh, and turning that memory in Hadoop, especially when we're talking about big clusters, you end up with terabytes of memory and you want to utilize that somehow. Mm -hmm. You don't want to just run a MapReduce on Hadoop without mm -hmm. utilizing the memory in it. Uh, so Spark's beauty comes in um, uh, what we call an RDD, uh, a resilient data set. 
uh, that, that actually brings the data from the disk and puts it in memory and allow you to process whatever you want in memory. Now, a lot of people think that Spark is one product. Spark is not one product. Spark is a framework or An set of components, yeah. exactly. So they have their uh, Spark streaming part, there's the Spark SQL part, there's the Spark machine learning part. Right. Uh, so, so Spark got different components. But and all of those are oriented towards in-memory. They Is are. The they are. So, so people could you work for example, with Spark Streaming, mm -hmm. uh, and and we work with Web Trends in the U.S. For example, and Web Trends, um, and, and and they were in Hadoop Summit talking about their 10 million messages per second using Spark Streaming, and that was pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so so if organization in Australia, where would they think about deploying Spark? Like, is there a particular use case? So we're we're talking to uh, a lot of organizations who are looking at Spark Streaming, for example. Spark mm -hmm. Streaming is cool. Because um, not everybody needs a real-time ingestion engine uh, or, or kind of like a real-time uh, analytical decision system, for example. So Spark works in a micro-batch, which is like a, a second, a half second, a, a, a 0.2 seconds, which is fine for 90% of the use cases. Yeah. Uh, so Spark streaming is definitely uh, trending. Uh, Spark SQL is what... What, it, what what people like uh, and sp well spark machine learning as well um, mainly because um, even if your data sits on hive and this is what we talk about in organizations you'll have your traditional bi teams mm -hmm. and you have your data science team and they probably work on the same data but you have to separate the resources so how do we separate the resources for example the bi gets hive and we set uh, Hive got an in-memory part, which is TES, and we set the memory in TES to be dedicated to the BI team. Yeah. And we give access to the data scientists to the same exact data sets on Spark. So Spark brings the data, put it in memory, and give it to the data scientist, and you right. have two portions of memory working for completely two different groups. Mm -hmm. Okay, very cool. Um, so, yeah. And we will talk about the next generation BI analytics as well, BI analysts who will probably know a little bit more than SQL. So it'll be like more SQL and Python. They will be like more SQL and, and yeah. um, Scala, for example. Okay, cool. So, so we always encourage our guests to uh, you know, demo something. Yeah, that's part of the technique. Yeah, well, so, did you, know, you come prepared? Uh, really well, cool. <laughs> we want to see something. Uh, okay, so I've got... Um, uh, I want to introduce first. Um, so, uh, so by the magic of the tech basement technology, your demo is going to appear behind us, us. Yeah, behind us, yeah. so everybody can see your your demo. Um, so we can edit that later on as well, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Why would you need to? Because your demo is so yeah. perfect. You mean if your demo crashes? <laughs> yeah. oh, come on, let's. Uh, so first of all, let me let me tell you about this cool tool, and and the the, the cool part of my job that I always. Uh, get to uh, play with new tools and, and experiment new tools. And if I find a tool that will actually uh, make uh, make a difference, um, I'll actually start presenting it to people and customers. Even if we don't support it, it doesn't matter because we it's, it's all just about open source and, and um, trying to get people on open source. So Zeppelin, Apache Zeppelin. <laughs> Funny, Apache Zeppelin was uh, founded by a Korean company, NF Labs, uh, and I'm lucky enough to, to see these guys um, next week. I've seen them in Sparks um, Summit in, um, in San Francisco this year as well. So, um, so, so this you, is sitting in front of a Hadoop instance. Yeah, if you have worked, have you worked with uh, IPython before? Have you heard of IPython? No. So IPython was the uh, de facto notebook style for Python in the past, um, and it had their own uh, visualization. And it was it was a great product. Uh, and comes after it came Jupyter, and Jupyter allowed uh, the data scientist to connect to Spark, for example, and run an instance in Spark using Jupyter mm -hmm. and give you that notebook style. Yep. So, if you look at Spark, for example, if you want to work with Spark, you're gonna work with a long stack tra stack trace of black screen until you find a number. So the notebooks give you um, a better way of of working with stuff. So mm -hmm. as you can see now, uh, th this is I can I can easily create a new notebook or or just browse through my notebooks here. Uh, so this is actually I'm gonna show you a data set that that I have uh, 
presented uh, recently. And that data set was actually part of um, the Australian data sets, mm -hmm. uh, data.gov.au. Have you been there, Matt, before? Yep. What do you think? It. It's a lot of data you can get to, right? This is, is a great cool? initiative yeah. from the government, don't you think so? Mm -hmm. And the cool thing is they also have a state uh, data um, repositories and a, um, kind of like a, a country data repository. So publicly available? We're all it looking at publicly available is, data here. Yeah. So, um, so cool thing, the ATO, um, so I had the ATO data set, I downloaded that and I and I uh, put it into... Um, An ATO for the non aussie uh, The Australian <laughs> Taxation Office. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so I, I had all the data sitting, uh, one part of the data was sitting in a, in a MySQL database and the other part was sitting on, on Hive. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've ingested this data, uh, normalize it and transform it a little bit and just put it in a, in a database. And it was mainly just to show people how cool this new ecosystem is. Yeah. Uh, and, and how different it, 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 it can make. So, so you brought in, it looks like, taxes by uh, uh, area? Yeah, so that's ATO. right. Yeah. So this is actually the complete tax um, uh, tax profile for um, a normal taxpayer. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was based on postcode. Mm -hmm. and, and what I wanted to show people, I wanted, or I want to see myself actually, how... Um, what is the most suburbs that pay the most of tax mm. in Australia uh, and which uh, suburbs actually get the most refunds back? Mm -hmm. uh, so so definitely because I had postcodes, I had to grab the Australian postcode data set from the Australian, oh, yeah. um, Australian post um, uh, office. And after that, uh, if you can see here... So you're showing two... It's kind of cool, actually. You're showing two different data sets. You know, one second one's very simple, but you're bringing them in. Exactly. Correlating the data. Exactly. And this is what we're talking about. So if I'm bring, bringing two different tables here from two different places, and one of them uh, comes to be Hadoop, uh, and I'm joining these things, the, both of the tables in memory, and I'm actually, if you can see the two lines here, that's saying, you know what, I want to cache both of the data sets. And once I say cache, that means I'm going to grab Ultra the whole fast. data yeah. set and I'm going to put it on in memory after the first transaction that I'll be doing next. Because yeah. the first transaction always happens from the disk and then... So this brings it up out of the that lake into the memory. Exactly, exactly. So if you can see here, I was just doing select statement just to see how the data would look like. And the cool thing in a notebook, uh, a notebook works with something we call an interpreter. And if you look at an interpreter, you can actually write in Spark, which is Scala usually. You can write in PySpark, which is Python. You can write just SQL. You can add dependencies. And a very cool thing uh, that I've checked that out on their roadmap that they're com coming with R as well in the future. So which means once they have R, they have the complete um, uh, set of tools for the data scientists, which yeah. is really cool. Wow, that, that, that was a really cool uh, demo, Ned. Thanks for showing Thanks, us that. Dean. Yeah, of Great course, use case like of Hadoop and some really cool uh, technologies. So Ned, I got a, a question for you. And obviously Hortonworks, you work a lot with EMC. Um, can you talk a bit about the the value of EMC and Hortonworks together? Like, what is it that we bring to a customer um, that you otherwise wouldn't get if we worked we didn't work together collaboratively? So EMC is definitely um, a strategic partner for Hortonworks. Um, EMC is part of the ODP as well, and um, uh, EMC got some cool technologies out there. Um, Isilon, uh, for example, uh, Isilon is. One of the probably storage leader in the data lake stories, and when when, when we say about moving data and, and trying to do the analytics on data with with things like Isilon, we actually bring the analytics into Isilon. With with Isilon, got what over three thousand customers now, mm -hmm. uh, so it's kind of easy to just build Hadoop as a software layer, utilizing whatever uh, data that sits on Isilon right now. So I think. Part of it is bringing the analytics to the data rather than bringing the data to the analytics, uh, which saves probably time. Probably the enterprise feature as well, yeah. because the enterprise feature ticks a lot of boxes that um, uh, that Hadoop is trying to get it there, but mainly from a hardware la layer, which is like like things like um, uh, securing the disks itself from from um, uh, uh, encrypting the disks um, and, and that sort of stuff. Okay, so helping to make Hadoop enterprise ready. Definitely. Really Definitely. Story. Cool. All right. And, and last question, because we're almost out of time, but is there something cool you're working on now personally? Uh, so, yeah, personally, I am working on something uh, funny. It is related to the same space that I'm, um, uh, that I'm working with. Um, so uh, it, it would need Hadoop at some stage. 
so I'm working on a, on a on a small app that actually um, smartly generates a playlist of songs based on the people around that geographical uh, location, for example. So let's say um, you and your wife in a restaurant um, having dinner. How awesome it would be if you're going to listen to the music that both of you like. Uh, so actually the, the app will grab the playlist of yours and, and your wife, for example, and all the people surrounding you in the place uh, from Spotify or Pandora and will generate a smart playlist based on the audience and the people surrounding that spot. So this is like the beacon example we had from retail, Correct. but it's sort of in reverse where it's kind of helping this out is, This is the IoT, consumer. man. This is IoT. Wow, and sort of things. So build, and building more a group playlist rather than the individual playlist. That Correct. Yeah. Correct. Very you cool. Know, wonder, how did they know my favorite song. <laughs> exactly. You're be like, oh, you know what? I love this place. I'm going to come here yeah. all over again just to listen to the songs. All right. Very good. Ned, it's been a pleasure to have having you here. So Thank Ned Chawa, Systems Engineer with Hortonworks. Thank, Thank you, you so for much. your time. Pleasure. Um, and you've been? Mm -hmm. Your name? Oh! <laughs> and Dean Jackson, so obviously unscripted. And just want to say thank you for being thank our you, very Dean. first guest. Thank you, Dean. Thanks a lot. Thanks, thank you, Matt. I would definitely love to be here again. Uh, and if you're having another uh, a tech basement, I'll, I'll just play Xbox next time. <laughs> so, sounds like a plan. So, Dean Jackson, Matt Solensky, thank you. Uh, thank you for watching Tech Basement. Thanks.